All right, hey everybody. Um, hopefully some more people will stumble in here. But some of you, most of you out of the five or six here don't know who I am, so I'll tell you a little bit about me first and then what my message is and uh, what I'm trying to bring to, to this convention and really to the libertarian movement in general. So I'm from Houston, Texas, and I've been an activist since 2009. I started an activist community called the Houston Freethinkers in 2010. Um, so far, we've been the only city to successfully kick the TSA off of our buses. They tried to bring them to the buses and we're the only city to kick them out after just two weeks. That was in 2012. Been involved in a lot of community gardening, you know, raising money for various charities, confronting politicians, you know, the whole range of activism, you know, working within the art community, music community. Um, so I've been doing that for since 2010. I started doing journalism, freelance journalism in 2013, and now that's what I do full time. So I write for activistpost.com and Mid Press News out of Minnesota. And I do a lot of traveling. I got to cover the uh, Silk Road trial, among others. And you know, it's just become a full-time gig. So that's what I do. And I try to use journalism as a way to get people to recognize the problems with government and hopefully bring them to looking for solutions. Um, and I also recently wrote two books. Uh, the first one came out last year, and it's called Conscious Resistance, Reflections on Anarchy and Spirituality, which is uh, a little bit of you know my message. I guess I've sort of become known as a spiritual anarchist, and it's sort of assumed that my talk is going to be about spirituality, so they put me on Sunday, so I guess I'm supposed to be in church. <laughs> uh, but my talk isn't really going to focus on that today. It's still part of the overall message, but that will be towards the end. Um, so the first book came out last year. The second book is actually coming out next Friday, and it's called Finding Freedom in an Age of Confusion. And it's basically going to be part of a trilogy of books, which the first one, like I said, it brings the synthesis of looking at traditions around the world throughout history and how they have actually had anti-authoritarian uh, thoughts since the beginning, Christianity, um, shamanism, shamanistic traditions, native traditions, uh, the Tao, Buddhism. You can look at the origins of many of these traditions and see that they were actually really freedom-minded and freedom-based, but it's only over time that they've sort of become, just like the state, that the religious institution has got a hold of them. Change them. So we explore that in the first book. The second one is more dealing with uh, just you know the realities of what it's like to start questioning the nature of our world. You know, que questioning the government, questioning all the various systems that interact with us. And for a lot of people, they go through a period of anger, grief. It's like you know grieving. You just wake up to the world being not at all what you thought it was. You know, and it can be a very difficult process for a lot of people. So the second book is focused on that. Just essays that are about empowerment, trying to get people to see the strength that we all have within ourselves, so that we can. You know, build up and get to being able to uh, find a more free place. Because essentially, my message is that until we all do our own internal work, our own internal healing, deal with our doubts and insecurities and fears that we all have from you know whatever our environments and just growing up, until we deal with that, our own internal issues, there's no way that we're going to create a more free world. You know, we can get rid of the state tomorrow, we can reduce government, but I believe until each of us do that internal healing, we're just going to either elect more people or you know, put more people in power, and eventually those same problems will come to the surface. Um, so that's what the trilogy of books gonna, is going to focus on. The third one will be out next year, and you guys are basically going to get a preview of what that third book is. That's what I'm going to talk about today. It's going to be a pretty much a, a manual, a how-to on how to exit the state, how to become more free. I haven't paid taxes in five years, and I promote that openly because I think it's an, an empowering thing that more people need to be willing to take those steps. Not everybody's able to, and that's fine. But I've been able to, you know, through my journalism, I get paid Bitcoin, and most of my income is completely in the counter economy, which is what we're going to talk about today. Yesterday, I don't know if you guys, for any, anyone here was at the lunch yesterday when Jeff Dice spoke um, from Mises Institute. And I really enjoyed some of the, the things he was asking uh, libertarians about Big L and Little L those associated with the party and those just doing various forms of libertarian activism, for us to be honest and to look at our actions and to evaluate uh, the return, you know, the investment that we put in and what we get from that, you know, what forms of activism are working the best, you know. Um, I can say for the Houston Freethinkers, we started out a lot, there was, you know, a lot of uh, younger people, I'm 30, I'm 30 years old, I started out when I was 25, so it was people my age and people older, there was a lot of anger at that time, 2010, 2011, 12, so there was a lot of protesting, going out to the streets, the Occupy group and all these sort of things. Over time, we get less and less people who come to the group now asking for protests. They want to come and they want to find solutions. They want to know how they can get involved in their community. And I feel like that's just part of us as a group being able to see, well, did the protesting get us anything that we wanted? You know, we got out there, we met new people, we raised awareness in some ways. You know, we were to confront politicians and senators, et cetera, but the NDA was still passed. You know, these, the internet bills continue to march forward. All these things that we were trying to raise awareness or hoping that we could 
slow down, they continue, you know, and they still continue. But when I look at my actions involved in the community farm, and I see, you know, this return of produce that allows people in the fifth ward, one of Houston's poorest neighborhoods, to come in there and to pick their vegetables and greens in a neighborhood where there's no, no grocery stores at all. All they have is, you know, corner stores. It's really, it's what's considered a food desert. When I see that, to me, that is a return that I can see. That's that's value that I can see. Wow, my time, my energy, and the community that I work with, we put that in there, and we can get something back from that. So I think it's important for us to do that, to start evaluating our actions, and to see if you know electoral politics, voting, um, you know, even within the third party, if it's getting us what we want, and if not, to reconsider and to look at other strategies. And today, I'm going to talk about two different strategies that I think everyone in this room, to various degrees, could, could employ in their own lives to make their, their lives more fruitful, more free from the state, and to empower ourselves and the local community. So the idea, I'm kind of borrowing it from Herr Byland. He's a Swedish, um, Austrian economist. He writes for um, I see, the Mises occasionally. And he wrote this essay in 2006 that apparently nobody paid attention to, but I discovered it because I just dig around a while on the internet and I'm a nerd for this stuff. Um, and he talks about vertical and horizontal tourism, or what he calls introvert and extrovert. So I'm going to explain what these ideas are and give you examples of them and hopefully by the end of this you guys can you know, have some ideas for ways that you can empower yourself. So the first one, what he called vertical or the introvert strategy, he based those ideas off of another activist, libertarian activist, who uh, some of you may know his name is Carl Hess. He's since deceased, but in the 60s and the 70s and in the 80s he was very active. In the 60s when it was the, the new left student movement and the old right, Murray Rothbard, a lot of libertarians, this is before the Libertarian Party was even created, a lot of them were active on campuses, and Carl Hess was among those people. And for a brief period of time, the left and the right aligned. And there was a jur the journal Left and Right, Murray Rothbard wrote that for three or four years. They had two conferences where they tried to bring communists and socialists and you know, libertarian anarchists together to varying degrees of success. Um, but Carl Hess was involved a lot of that. He started out as a speechwriter for Barry Goldwater and then went you know, into anarchist of the loo and kind of went back a little bit this way but by the end of his life towards the end of his life he moved to washington dc to the adams morgan neighborhood and he was able to completely transform this neighborhood he wrote a book called community technology which i think is worth pursuing for anyone who's interested in community building community technology and in the book they detail how they were able to start various community networks they started uh, rooftop gardens they started uh, aquaponics systems in people's basements he was really big on tools and technology and saying that you know the tools were what allowed people to be free. You know, being able to share tools is what allows people access to the means of production, to creating things, to becoming an entrepreneur. You know, without tools, you're essentially, you know, you're unable to do a lot of things. So he created the system where anybody could they had a collection of community tools that anybody could come and borrow, tool share basically. And so his book describes the successes and the failures of that. It lasted for about four or five years, and uh, you know, he's very open about where they failed what they could have done better and what succeeded and how he was able to do that. So that using those those ideas, building community networks, being involved in urban farming, community gardens, farmers market, even these are you know these are the vertical, the introvert strategy. The reason they're introverted, you'll see uh, in a moment the extrovert strategies for those who are maybe a little bit more bold and ready to go to do things which are considered illegal by the state. But in this, anybody, no matter where you live, you know, whatever your background is, you can start to purchase less of your groceries from the grocery store, from this food production system that really don't serve any of us, you know. And whether you're a meat eater or not, we can all admit that the current mass food production with pesticides, with you know, genetically modified foods, and just with the mistreatment of animals is not what I think any compassionate libertarian truly supports, you know. So, you know, my goal is to get people to question not only the mechanisms that rule us through the state, but looking at all the various forms of you know, control and influence that that are put upon us and which ways we can liberate ourselves from them. So I don't like having to go to the grocery store and be dependent on food that is coming from California or from you know some other state and has to be trucked thousands of miles and all this energy has to go into it. When I could take a 10 minute walk to the community farm by my house and I can go pick all of my vegetables and you know know that I'm providing uh, a source of, uh, of income for the people there at that local community and I'm keeping that project going. To me that's more rewarding and it's more in line with my values. And that's ultimately what I'm trying to do, is to make my life uh, in line with the values that I believe, not just talk about them and not just hope that one day a politician is going to give me the opportunity to create that life. I want to create that life now. So we can do that. We can start to become less dependent on grocery stores and start 
going to farmers markets or looking for local producers of, you know, I, I love mushrooms. So I've been searching in Houston for a, I found one source so far for mushrooms that are grown in the Houston area that don't have to drive too far. And the past two weeks, I've been putting more and more energy into that. And I haven't gone to the grocery store looking for a couple of items. And that's something that is a personal goal of mine. But that's just one example of, you know, a way that you can start to reduce your dependence on these systems. So the, the horizontal strategy, the extrovert strategy, it comes from the the uh, philosophy, the strategy of Samuel Edward Compton III. He wrote a book called The New Libertarian Manifesto and the Agorist Primer. Those are two really helpful books. And his ideas were agorism, counter-economics. So he takes the term agorism from the Greek word agora for the marketplace. And in Compton's view, agorism, his philosophy was libertarianism to the fullest extent, you know, to the ap actual application um, of the ideas. So his strategy was basically saying instead of trying to, you know, vote them out or believing that we can somehow, you know, have a violent revolution and actually fight the state and succeed, um, we can compete with the state itself, not competing within their system, but compete with that system completely. And his way to do this was what he called counter economics. And so uh, the counter economy is basically any area of trade of the economy that the state either says is you know unfavorable or illegal. So these are gray and black markets. So every time you get a haircut from a friend or you pay your neighbor to mow your lawn or you do something like that and there's no licenses, there's no businesses, no registration involved, that's the gray market. You're taking power away from the state in that small that small way because there's no taxes going back into that system. Um, and so that's that's the gray market and the black market would be again things that the state considers illegal. So your pot dealer, um, you know, the Silk Road was, was black market activity. These are things that, uh, whether or not we think that they're morally right or not, they're currently illegal by the state. And Compton's idea was if we start going into the gray and black markets and creating networks for people to exchange outside of the Federal Reserve note, um, then we will remove economic power from them. And he wrote this in the 70s, early 80s, way before Bitcoin was around. But in the book, he talks about, you know, recognizing that computers were just starting to become a big thing and he, he you know, predicted that technology would play a big role in taking us to this and look at what Bitcoin has done. You know, Bitcoin's only the beginning of what's possible. Um, and you know, so that's taking your power out of the mainstream economy, the status economy. And I think the, the fullest application of agorism though would be not only to have exchanges that don't involve the state, like gray markets. I have a gardening business in Houston. It's a team of activist volunteers, and we build gardens for people around the city. We've never got a business license. We don't ever plan to. It's just you know, communication with other free individuals. Hey, I'm looking for a garden. OK, this is what we can do. We agree on a price. We come over, we build it, and destroy. story. There's no middleman, no third party involved. That is gray market activity, and I think that's powerful. But I also believe that the next step in that would be then to stop using the Federal Reserve. Our business accepts silver, we accept Bitcoin, and that I think is whenever we're really challenging the state, which is why you know what we saw with the Silk Road trial, um, I just want to mention that the reason I really believe in this theory not only because I see it playing out and I study various uh, you know downfalls of the status economy and see that people always flood the black and gray markets. Regardless of the states there or not, we're gonna find a way to exchange, you know, we're gonna find a way to trade things, trade our goods, and that is the counter economy. We can be proactive and we can start building those networks now or we can wait till things get worse and, and hope that FEMA comes and help us or we can go try to you know, fight for people with food at the grocery stores or we can be the people that thought ahead and tell people, here's some seeds, here's some supplies, get yourself started. You know? And that's what I want to do. I don't want to be left in a position waiting for the state to take care of me. But this strategy, this idea, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to the state. And the state themselves said that. The judge in Ross's case specifically you know, both the ideas that Ross believed in and that the, you know, the quotes from Dread Pirate Roberts expressed an interest in agorism and moving the economy out of the state and giving people a power back. It was an experiment in agorism. And the judge specifically said one of the reasons she punished Ross so, so harshly was because his philosophy, the ideas were dangerous. You know, and they, she just wanted to make sure that anybody who dared take up his flag would, you know, be sent a signal that they would be punished harshly. And to me, that shows that they're afraid of that. You know, it wasn't just about giving people access to drugs. It was about this is the beginning of being able to have free exchanges where they can't touch them. You know? And that's what you know, the Silk Road, to me at least, well, that's what I took out of it, is that they're afraid that people are starting to find ways to move money out of their economy and to start organizing in peaceful ways that they don't like. So they can frame it, it's about drugs, it's about you know, motor accusations or whatever. But the reality is they're afraid that they're losing power. And I think that's 
you know, that's important to, to recognize that this philosophy, these ideas, they can be effective, but they're going to take a lot of groundwork and a lot of building. So how do we do this? How do we build the vertical or the horizontal strategy, whether you choose to be involved in your local economy, you know, and, and get involved with uh, farmers markets, urban gardening, et cetera, or just supporting those systems. If you know, not everybody wants to be in the dirt, and I understand that. I love to garden. I love to be out there and get my hands dirty. It's not for everybody, but you can support those systems. Like I said, you can start to lessen your dependence on the mainstream economy and the mainstream forms of governance and uh, food production and all these, and security, you know, start community protection networks, all these different ideas. But how do we get to that point? How can we, as an individual, come to the place where we, you know, we're able to enjoy these these uh, these new networks? I believe that one of the keys to doing this is a concept called freedom cells, which I picked up from John Bush, and John took it from Bob Podolsky, who wrote a book called Flourish, about hierarchy and about government. And Bob Podolsky, it, basically, him and his partner, they studied for years and years, tried to understand human relationships and the way people work, and they discovered that. People work best in groups of eight. Eight people plus or minus one or, you know, one or so. So seven to nine people basically, somewhere in that range. And he also believed that it would be best to have these groups divided equally, male and female. But he said, you know, when you start to go a little bit lower than that or too too many people beyond that, your effectiveness starts to taper off. You're not going to be less effective and people don't communicate as well. Um, so that was his target number, is building groups of eight people, what he called octologues, what we call freedom cells centered around various specific goals. What I want to do is take this concept, and we've already started building in Houston. We've got, you know, within the Houston Free Thinkers community I mentioned, we've taken people who are already involved in that and who are, you know, really die hard and ready to like, let's start talking about building this, net, this network. So we started meeting, and uh, the Freedom Cell idea is basically that you have eight individuals. You want to diffuse the power and the knowledge among those individuals. So maybe today your, your Freedom Cell says, let's build a community garden. So the eight of you go at that, you know, and you accomplish something really awesome in a matter of a couple hours. Maybe you guys meet every couple weeks and you say, okay, let's all learn as much as we can about aquaponics. Next week we'll meet and we'll teach each other. Um, so there's so many different ways that this structure can be used. It's also one, one thing that John kind of got me on is having this core group of people who are equally knowledgeable and equally prepared as you. So you get your freedom cell and everybody's got three months worth of backup supply of food for emergencies of all types. Everybody's got a form of encrypted communication. Everybody is proficient in the use of firearms. Um, everyone, what do we got? Food, what do we got? Backup food, encryption, what else do we got? Um, there's other things, there's other, <laughs> there's other skills that we're getting. But basically, the idea is that everybody, you know that you're not dependent on one individual. So I move, I leave, or I just become uninterested in the freedom cell. The other seven people are still able to continue their work, you know. Everybody maybe knows CPR, everybody has a certain amount of safety skills. So whatever project you're taking on, it's not dependent on one person, you know, so it's, it's a non hire situation. Everybody's going to have various strengths and weaknesses, and that's fine. It's not about, you know, trying to force equality through some, you know, illegitimate means. It's just about establishing that we're on the same base, that I can at least count that, say the shit hits the fan, that everybody in my freedom cell, we meet up and we have some sort of plan. And, you know, everybody there I know that they have food for themselves, they can fend for themselves. We're not all going to have to take care of one of those people, you know. And so the idea is you start establishing um, the freedom cells, you get your, your main cell, right, and then every individual also starts another freedom cell within their own community and within their own direct community. Eventually you have maybe eight to ten freedom cells of, you know, eight to ten people each, so you've got eight to hundred people right there, maybe scattered around your city. And, you know, this just starts to grow. And in the New Libertarian Manifesto, Conkin predicted that we would go from where we are, statism, he had four stages towards agoras or towards freedom, and he predicted that these little pockets of agoras, these communities, would start to pop up. You know, and at first it would be, you know, like you kind of slowly venture into that. And ironically, he also said that he thought that if anybody moved too quickly or too boldly, that the state would smash them down. And that might be an example of the Silk Road. You know, so he was also kind of adamant of being weary and being careful that you know, uh, at these stages as we progress, as the state becomes weaker and as statism fails and more people awaken to this message, which is, I think is all of our hope then people are going to start looking for other options, you know. As we're building these free communities and these networks of people who are not having used the Federal Reserve, you know, because ultimately, no matter what we want to do is in the Federal Reserve, audit the Fed, whatever, they're not going to do it within their system. And we can complain about it all day, but as long as we're using that Federal Reserve now, then we're still supporting it, you know. And that to me was a really just an eye-opening thing. Like, wow, if I really don't support these various systems, whatever it may be, then I need to find a way to reduce my dependence on them. And I think that that's what this, this is, a, is a tool for, is establishing that. So 
Um, one, of the, one of the criticisms that I want to put out there as far as uh, Conkin's ideas and agorism, after he wrote the New Libertarian Manifesto, Murray Rothbard um, criticized, they, they had a couple of essays back and forth where you know, they were just discussing the ideas. And even yesterday when I spoke with Jeff Dice of Mises, he sort of said that he felt it's, you know, it's an edgy thing, but it doesn't necessarily speak to the masses. And that's what Rothbard said. It's like the majority of people are wage workers, and they can't just you know, give up everything to go work in the black grain markets. And I completely empathize with that, and I do agree. I think the stage that we're at now is it's going to take individuals like myself and others who, for whatever reason, you know, they, they're either brave enough or they just have the freedom. I'm 31 years old, I'm not married, I have no kids, and I'm willing to take these risks to do certain things that I think are important for us to lay the groundwork so that others, as we progress forward, it won't be so difficult. Like John and Kat, I mean, they drove all around the country using Bitcoin and there's been a lot of hiccups, right? But as that has gone, they, they've learned a lot. You know, they taught other people about, hey, this doesn't work. This is the way to do this. If you're trying to use Bitcoin, you know, to pay for this. There's gonna be people like that who sort of, you know, trailblaze and show us the way and I believe as this progresses and more of these little pockets of free communities and free-minded networks around the country and really around the world start to pop up, people aren't blind. They're going to look and they're going to see themselves being heavily taxed and the state telling them how to live. And they're going to look over here and see their friends living a lot more fruitfully and happily and, and not being you know, stolen from constantly. And I believe that's when we will see more of, a, of an exodus from the system. Of course, Conkin always predicted and said something that um, Revolution, you know, if, if anything is, is certain, it's a, a revolution, and he means by that the state would eventually probably try to uh, to stop free-minded people. But I try to push forward without worry for that because I think that if we constantly are stuck in the fear and we're paralyzed by the what ifs of what is the state going to do, or it doesn't mean we should be ignorant and that we should take you know um, ignorant bold you know bold steps that aren't going to lead to our goals, but we should absolutely you know be unwavering in our commitment to freedom, and that's what I believe agorism is is uh, you know a strategy towards. Uh, Jeff also told me, he said, you know, some people want to live, the way he phrased it, he's like, I want to live my vanilla life, you know, my soccer mom, my suburban um, life, which is totally fine. I don't think that there's anything in this Agora strategy that says that people need to, everybody needs to live like pirates in the black and gray market. You know, some of us enjoy that lifestyle and want to go that direction. But I have a vision of thousands of autonomous communities interlocking, working together, empowered individuals who recognize the non-aggression principle, who recognize the value of life in all its forms, trading and exchanging with each other. And that's going to include people who, maybe you have a Christian community, maybe, you know, everybody can still live the way they want to. I think without the state, you would actually have, that's when you would have the freedom to choose to live as you want. And we wouldn't be forced to, uh, to deal with things and to accept things that go against our principles. And for those who, you know, maybe you're more of a constitutionalist, you're not necessarily interested in seeing the state evolve or be abolished, just that we reduce, I think, as agorists, we're just trying to help people vacate the state and live free. We're not trying to say that, hey, you need to be an anarchist too. No, I, I'm an anarchist. I'm definitely not you know, here to say to vote. I'm trying to build something that is outside the state that I think agorism helps us get to that. We can create, lay the groundwork to something new, not to the next state, and not even to say, hey, the rest of you, you need to be anarchists too. If you choose to live under the state and you just want it to get back to a constitutional form or you just want it to be reduced in some way, that's fine. You know, we can all live our own vision. And this is more of what is called panarchism, anarchism without adjectives, basically a bunch of communities coexisting without having to force their view upon each other. And my final point here is that, you know, as I said, this is happening in Houston. I, I'm going to be speaking several times this month, and I'm really putting my intention out there and hope that other people who are interested in these ideas will come forth. As I said, we have the Houston Freedom Cell. It's, you know, me, people younger than me, people older than me. We have a good mix of people who are interested in these ideas who are interested in getting land. And I'm putting it out there that by the end of this year, we would like to launch a homesteading project, an intentional community that is built upon the principles of non-aggression, on permaculture, working in balance with the planet, and uh, you know, mindfulness of trying to create these more conscious communities. And we're going to document the whole process and show people that, hey, even in the face of the state, you can still create a community that is based on your values and line with your values, and get as free as possible, um, obviously. Unfortunately, we still have to pay property taxes, but I think there may come a point where we can become strong enough to, and the state will be weak enough that we can say, hey, you know what, this year we're not going to pay, you know? And maybe that's down the line. But that's my vision. I want to create these, these conscious communities that can be built around sustainability, the non-aggression principle, libertarian values, and, and trying to help other people. You know, I don't want to just get to my free place and then turn my back on the rest of the world, because I've come to, to understand that as much as I'm an individual, that I'm seeking collective liberation through individual means, and 
I can't necessarily live happily and free knowing that everyone else I care about is still, you know, dealing with all this crap from the state and that good people are running in prison. You know, we have to find a way to to break down their power. And I think that the boldest way we can do that is to live free, to not wait for you know another time, but to do it now and to create these communities. Um, I'm definitely interested in, interested in talking to people who have more want more information on this. And I want to get back to my first point, which was evaluating our actions. Whenever I talk about this, sometimes people will tell me, well, why can't I vote and do what you're saying? And I think you can. You can choose to use your time however you, you please. But for me, you know, in the energy I see, even here, the good people here who are trying to work in a third party system. And yesterday we heard the numbers. The numbers are horrible, we have to be honest. Like 1%, this party's been around for 46 years and it hasn't gained, you know, anywhere close to the 5% that everybody's hoping that we would get to the next level, you know. And I'm not saying that we should give up on that. I just think that what's important, again, to evaluate your actions and the investment versus the return. So when you go to your community garden, if you start investing in your community itself, meeting your neighbors, talking, just breaking down all these false barriers that, you know, have been really foisted upon us and in some ways we choose to divide ourselves, you know. We look at ourselves as libertarians, the rest of them must be statists, and the rest of them must, you know, they like, they, they can't be like me, but I think it's important for us to find that common ground in our communities, build those relationships, and then at the end of the day, at the end of the year, when the election comes and Hillary or Trump or whoever's elected, ask yourself, you know, how much time, look at how much time and energy you put into voting into looking for a candidate, whether it's third party or otherwise, and then look at what you've been able to build in your community and see what gave you a better value, you know, a better result out of that. And be honest about it and be willing to say, you know, if, if uh, you know, your time voting wasn't valuable. Or even if, the, if I'm wrong, if your community sucks and you didn't get anything out of it, you know, unfortunately, that might happen, you know. Sometimes you have to build it. That's what I felt like I had to do. I met a lot of awesome people in Houston. There's a lot of good people doing things, but they weren't doing them the way that I thought it needed to be done, so we just built a community and it became this awesome activist community. And now we're ready to take it to the next stage of actually building a community that has land that we can open up to other people, that we can have you know, monthly farmers markets, that we can have workshops and skill shares and teach people how to take care of themselves as we learn to do it. Because I'm not speaking from any sort of you know, all-knowing point at all. Like this, is, this is all a learning lesson for me, and these are things that are being built right now. I just want to remind again that agorism is powerful, counter-economics is powerful, the state knows that, they put Ross away because of that, and it's time for more of us to be bold in that way, to go in the direction, not to create another silk road, but to get involved, whether vertically or horizontally, in your community, and to finding strategies that can take power away from the state and bring the power back to the people. And as I said earlier, you know, I'm sort of the spiritual anarchist. My last point would be that nothing I said today matters at all until we start working on whatever is wrong in here, you know, all the healing that we need to do as individuals. And I say that pretty confidently, knowing that of all the people I've talked to over the years, like there's at all different backgrounds, everybody's got some issue that they're working through and expresses itself in different ways, and that's just being a human being. The more that we're open about that and we try to deal with whatever insecurities and you know things we need to heal from, the stronger we're gonna be, the more powerful we're gonna be, the more liberated we will be in here and physically. And that's when these things will happen. So until we're ready to do that, I don't think that we will be able to create those communities. But I hope that in the next year we can show you guys what it's like to build a conscious of our own. Now, I've been wondering, uh, how can the Libertarian Party and people who are more on the lines of agorism and counter uh, economics work together on some things so we can help with various local ordinances help you do the things that you're doing? Like I was thinking, uh, I know in Louisiana they have no uh, yard sale license necessary. Or that, I imagine that would help you go in the gray market and sell things without taxes and all that. Absolutely. I mean, that's so. and that's why I'm here. You know, I got asked to speak here, and I feel like there's already some crossover in the message. You know, you've got people here speaking about Bitcoin. You've got people speaking about the gray market already. And one thing that I recognized recently uh, when I was talking to somebody about this is we already have. There's so many people who are already agorists who are already in the counter economy. They just don't recognize it. But they're what I would consider to be unconscious agorists, like, and not to mean that they're you know, not aware. It's just that they don't. They're not doing it with any sort of philosophical backing. Like, whenever I start a business and we're in the gray market, I'm doing it to send a message. Like, this, I want to help build gardens, but really, I want to make sure that any money I make is taken out of the state. But there's also people who are doing yard sales. You know, like I said earlier, you know, getting somebody to cut your lawn, whatever it is. There's a lot of people already in the gray and black markets. They just haven't recognized the power that is in there. And so I feel like. When we can get people to understand that there's value in that, 
those who are working in the Libertarian Party who are already kind of, you know, they're almost there, can help reduce the amount of government on the local level. Like you said, yard sales, that's, to me, anywhere anybody can set up a table and sell lemonade or sell whatever, that's, that's algorithm right there. That's the counter economy, you know, like a little kid with a lemonade stand, you know. And, um, I've been doing some study recently about Peru in the 80s, and they had basically a similar situation where the government got really oppressive, there's a lot of terrorism, and the people started fleeing that. And what did they do? They created what they called the informal economy. So people went out like into the rural areas, they started creating their own houses, they started creating their own markets. It was totally agorism, but eventually they went into the state, unfortunately. But it was just a reaction. I think people instinctively, you know, without government, without these systems, we're going to find a way to organize. We're going to find a way to do that. And while the state exists and it has prohibition, these are the gray and black market. But I think the goal is also eventually to, if the state's gone, then it'll just be, it'll just be, you know, uh, trade or the exchange. It won't be illegal. It won't be taboo anymore. It'll just be the way that we interact, you know, in a more free way because there'll be no interference. You know? So um, yeah, I think that if you're trying to work together with agorists, with voluntarists, then the way is to keep pro promoting alternative currencies, keep promoting exchanges outside the state because. Uh, you know, people who are in the Libertarian Party, they already understand the problem with the Federal Reserve. They understand the value of silver, gold, alternative currency. So that's already an agorist idea. We just need to maybe, we could build up the, that particular relationship, you know. Um, because, you know, I'm willing to come here because, even though I don't vote, because I know that there's people like yourselves and others who are already sort of in the same, we're already kind of taking the same path, maybe just stopping off at different points, you know, for different strategies. Anything else? Yep. Um. It, it reminds me of just going back to the way it was. I mean, when I was growing up, for example, you didn't, well, I, I'm shocked that you need a license for a garage sale. I didn't even know that. She just told me, Tatiana just told me that in New Jersey you need to pay $400 to show me your own driveway. <laughs> That's the best one. That's I mean, the awesome. state is just the tentacles keep yeah. reaching into everybody's lives in more minute ways to grasp money and power. And, um, it's devolved very rapidly, and even from when I was a kid, and then of course way before that, with you know when this country was founded, I mean it was free, basically. Yeah, and I yeah. think that they're they're and working against themselves though, because like you said, like their tentacles are everywhere, right? And this is uh, like I was the example I always feel is like you've got people living in the state right here, and people choosing to slowly exit and become more free. They're gonna just keep looking over there. I gotta pay money to shovel my own driveway. I gotta pay money to do a yard sale. These guys over here just—they're just exchanging, doing whatever. And honestly, the gray market—I, I really feel like that's a good starting point because, as I said earlier, so many people are already there. You're already like you're, you're you know going to a yard sale, or whatever it may be. It's, it's just an easy step to take, you know. And that's Federal Reserve notes out of their economy, but we're still sort of circulating. So the best step is that we can get gray market crypto activity or other, you know, more people accepting silver and things like that to, to really take the power away from them. But yeah, my grandmother, she's, uh, you know, same thing. She's been really inspired to me. She's grown up on a farm and she always just tells me like how much they, you know, just how different it was and how much more free they were able to just do whatever they want. And just normal. Just which is normal. why she's just like, I'm going to stay on my farm and just be and, over here. <laughs> and, and one other point, I think you're right that people, not only libertarians, but just people are feeling it more and more because it's getting more and more and I'll strike up conversations with people intentionally, kind of going, hey, you know, I, I don't know, just little things within the context of what we're doing, and they're like, yeah, it's outrageous. You know, there's a lot of people who are really feeling it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think there's definitely a place for this to, you know, grow. And it's a generational change. You know, I, I, def I feel like some of the, the, uh, the desire to vote or to work within government is for those, and not necessarily people in this room, but for those who, they see a problem and they want an immediate, you know, immediate fix to it. And government pitches itself as like, oh yeah, just vote and you know, your problems will be solved. But that's not realistic. You know, the change I believe like, it starts inside and it's a generational change. So, you know, those of us who are building now, I think that we're going to make it easier for you know all the kids that we see within the libertarian movement that like, they're just going to be on some next level stuff that we can't even imagine. But it takes work. You know, we can't just sit around the next 30 years and hope that it happens. Um, so that, you know, that's my goal, is just encourage people to find ways. And like I said, there's so many simple ways to do it, you know, just whether it's that farmer's market or, um, you know, being willing to host a, a yard sale and, and just kind of be bold about that. And at the same time, that creates conversation. You know, you tell people like, hey, you know, the city wanted me to get, pay them $100 to do this, but I just said, screw it, I'm just doing this. And like you said, people go, like, what, really? You have to pay to do that? And conversations start, and, you know, the message works itself in that way. And 
then you know who knows where it leads. And, uh, so I, I have hope that these ideas will continue to spread, and I know that I'm going to do what I can to continue to spread them. Uh, so if you are, well, I live in New Jersey, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not really planning on moving out until I go and live on a farm. Yeah. Um, and I have a lot of libertarian friends, but they're kind of scattered around the country. So in a more regular role place, how can somebody that's still kind of urban, how can somebody be doing some of the freedom cell work if they're not really there in order to build up those relationships. Like how, I mean, yeah. what am I going to do, put an ad out? Like Anyone want to learn how to do CPR? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be difficult. I, and this is definitely something that I, other people have said to me as well, because you know, on the internet, we're all so big. There's just so many of us there, right? But then scattered yeah. throughout so many places. And some people live in a city where they might not you know, meet another like-minded person, or at least they haven't come across them. I fully believe that there, there are other people out there. It's just like the way to connect. Um, and I've had the, the, the blessing, I guess, of building this community over the past five years, so it's kind of like there's already a pool of people to kind of pull from, like, hey, who wants to take this to the next level? But if you're just starting out, I mean, I don't know, Jersey, especially where you're at, I feel like it might be pretty difficult to meet other yeah, like-minded people. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, maybe, you know, you go to a farmer's market or something, and you know, you're going to meet other people who are at least health conscious, they're looking for something other than just, like, the factory farming you know, experience, and, yeah, I mean, I don't know. You're good at talking to people. I'm sure you can easily meet other people. But it's, I mean, it can be difficult, which is why I feel like laying the groundwork now, it makes it easier for other people to come out, you know, sort of come out of the woodwork, because then they don't have to take either one to, to, to blaze the trail. You know, it's already, the groundwork's already there. But we also, at the same time, need pioneering spirits like yourself to be in places where, okay, there's nobody, and I'm going to be the one to just start promoting it. Or, or, or. And really, you do a lot of you know, promoting similar ideas through promoting Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, because that's obviously been one of the biggest tools we've had so far, you know, I don't think, I, like, I don't think that the, I have problems with the ride sharing services and a lot of peer-to-peer -peer networks right now because I don't think they're as far as we should go. Like, I don't use bank accounts, I don't use credit cards, and I can't operate with any of those things, you know. Ride shares, uh, 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 TaskRabbit, or um, Airbnb, like, those all, you have to have, like, a credit card, a bank account to connect to it. I want something that's fully aggregate that just connects you know, allows, like for example, I use Couchsurfing a lot. Couchsurfing is really peer-to-peer, -peer. it's really aggressive. And I feel like Airbnb and these others have kind of hopped in and they're kind of playing that role. But it's really corporate entities behind them that they're still keeping you connected with that same system. Whereas Couchsurfing is a peer-to-peer -peer system that anybody can sign up online. You can search around where you're traveling, right? I, like I have, I'm a host in Houston, right? So I'll get emails constantly from somebody, hey, flying in from Germany, I'll be in town two days, looking for someone to show me around, or just looking for a place to crash. There's no money involved, it's just communication. There's a rating system on the website that says stay away from this crazy weirdo, or this person's nice, I had a great time with them, you know? So it's a peer, it's really a peer-to-peer -peer network. That is what I hope that, you know, I, I had hoped that Airbnb would be, and I used it, and I'm like, okay, well, it's cool, but it's still like for an agorist like me who isn't trying to use the banks, because I don't want, again, I don't want to support the same, these banks that are screwing us all over. So I try to limit my interaction with them. And I really hope that we're going to get more, and it is happening. I have a few friends who are developing apps right now that would really be uh, liberating. We need some investment in that to get it finished. But basically an app that would do that would allow you GPS location to find people in your community. Every individual could sign up and say, hey, I make art, I'm selling strawberries, I have CDs for sale, I do, I'm a welder, whatever it is, you can search for whatever you need and find somebody within you know, however many miles and connect. And then it's up to you to decide, do you pay them in cash, do you pay them in Bitcoin, do you just trade work? The app doesn't take any money. There's no third party. That's what we really need. And that, to me, is going to be the next level. We're just not there yet. There's still people who are they're trying to pitch that idea, but they're still trying to, you know, there's nothing wrong with profiting off it, but they're trying to keep a hold on it. You know, we need to let these systems be open source and completely out there for people, so people can adapt them and change them. Um, and, and I think it's coming. It's the technological revolution is already taking place, and as much as government wants to try to stop it, they ultimately won't be able to. So I have faith and hope. And and taking action. It's not just faith and hope, it's taking action to make sure that these things happen. Because um, just for those who, agorism, there's three A's in agorism that Kant can put up. The Agora, which is the marketplace of exchange, the anarchy, which is self-rule, lack of state, and an action. You know, you're really big on this, none of these things will happen without action. Or anything. That's why the, the books about Agora are like about this big, because there's not a lot to say. The ideas are really simple, and then you just do them. You know, they have to be done. Um, so, anything else? Thank you guys.